Wir haben uns Folgendes überlegt. Wir wollten den Aufschlag ähm, gerne ähm, Cécile Branche geben, die uns mit einer kurzen Keynote in das Thema einführt. Dieses Thema äh, Capsat-Verordnung und Copyright-Direktive, das hat vielleicht jeder schon einmal gehört. Das Problem ist, dass kaum einer weiß, was es denn eigentlich ist. Und damit wir den Saal ein bisschen einsammeln, ähm, ähm, wird Cécile uns jetzt einen, eine kurze Einführung geben, eine Keynote geben. Und ähm, dann sehen wir, wie es weitergeht. Damit, Cecile, it's your floor. Thank you, Jobst. Um, and I will speak in English. I hope it's, uh, every, um, it's okay for everybody. Um, so, my keynote is about how to ensure fair remuneration for audiovisual authors in the digital area. Um, This is the topic of the day, I hope, uh, and uh, you have to understand that it's not a usual one when we discuss copyright issue um, in the European institutions. Um, very often, uh, audiovisual authors like uh, film directors uh, are put at the forefront of industry events such as a film festival or a political campaign. Um, however, their situation in terms of uh, Uh, their remuneration, their author's right, their position in the industry, um, and uh, uh, the, the, what is their input, uh, their creative activity, um, are usually unknown from uh, policy makers. Uh, so this panel discussion is a real opportunity to put the spotlight on these authors, and I, I guess many of you in the audience are audiovisual authors. Um, and so we will um, uh, discuss the challenges uh, you are facing in the digital era and the opportunities that uh, European legislation can offer. So I will set the scene for the, the panel discussion in a way. Uh, I will briefly uh, introduce you the Society of Audiovisual Authors and then uh, present you the uh, world of uh, audiovisual authors, who they are, uh, how their career looks like, uh, and how they are paid. Then I will introduce the uh, European copyright reform that is underway, uh, with the two pieces of legislation uh, which represent opportunities for audiovisual authors the Broadcasting and Retransmission uh, Regulation and the Copyright Directive in the Digital Single Market. Um, finally, I will explain what's missing in this two uh, piece of legislation and uh, present you the campaign we developed for the, an unwaivable right to remuneration. So very briefly, the Society of Audiovisual Authors is a European association which gathers 31 audiovisual authors' collective management organizations. Um, that are managing rights for um, audiovisual authors. Um, it was established in 2010 with the main objective of um, um, promoting audiovisual authors' rights, their remuneration, and to develop efficient remuneration um, models. Uh, to start with, in 2011, we published a white paper uh, presenting the situation of uh, audiovisual authors in Europe uh, in terms of their rights and remuneration. Uh, that we updated in 2015 for the newly elected uh, European Parliament and Commission and to encourage them to act to improve the situation of these authors. Um, in Europe, when we talk about audiovisual authors, we mainly talk about screenwriters and directors of uh, feature films, TV series, uh, documentaries and other multimedia works. Um, but in a number of countries, other categories, uh, such as directors of photography, costume designer, etc., are also considered audiovisual authors, whether by law or contract. There is no harmonization of the authorship on the audiovisual work, except that the director has to be um, one of the uh, co-authors, at least. Um, as far as the composer of the original music um, of a film, he, can also be considered as a co-author of the audiovisual work or of its own contribution, but the way his rights are uh, managed follow uh, the music industry uh, business model, so they are not concerned with what I'm going to talk about right now. Um, directors uh, together with actors usually uh, are the faces of the audiovisual industry. Um, screenwriters and directors are the modern storyteller, I would say, of, um, um, in the cultural uh, sector, and uh, uh, they 
uh, represent uh, the um, creativity uh, and uh, the cultural diversity in, in the audiovisual sector. You have to know that they are freelancers uh, bringing original projects to producers, to broadcasters, spending a lot of time uh, developing new projects uh, while not always being paid um, for it. Uh, you can see on this uh, slide that each project can take from two to ten years, uh, uh, from the beginning uh, until the end. Um, and most of audiovisual authors develop many projects in parallel uh, to, s to expect that one of them is picked up by a producer and enter really into production. So, how are audiovisual authors paid? Well, in theory, uh, their remuneration on a project is uh, met from the money for the working time, writing or writing the script or directing the film or both, uh, which requires specific um, uh, skills. Um, their remuneration should also include uh, um, money for the transfer of rights to the producers. There is a presumption of transfer of right to producers in many countries. Um, and then uh, ongoing remuneration for the actual exploitation of the work, because this is what authors' rights are all about. You are associated to the exploitation of the work. In reality, most audiovisual authors in Europe receive a lump sum payment at the production stage for all of this, for the working time, for the transfer of rights, and the future exploitation of the work. Even in a country like France, uh, where proportionate remuneration is a principle in the law, it has been shown that uh, less than 3% of authors receive anything from the producer beyond the minimum guaranteed agreed in the contract. So if you consider that authors are freelancers with no guarantee that there will be another contract after the current one, you realize the extraordinary instability uh, of their career in such a competitive environment. There are lots of authors who want to be active in the audiovisual industry. The problem lies very much in the overemphasis that is given to the author's contract with the producer. A contract defines not only the terms and condition of the job, uh, but also the value of the rights transferred and how the author will be connected to the future exploitation of his work. The problem is that the contract negotiation takes place before the audiovisual work exists and its value is known. So how to determine the value of the rights in this context? In practice, because all these parameters are unknown, the remuneration of an author is determined by the budget of the project, um, if it's known, not, well, not always the case for a screenwriter, and mainly uh, by the reputation and the experience of the author. So there is a big misunderstanding on the capacity of contracts to determine a fair remuneration to audiovisual authors for the exploitation of their work. This is not necessarily the producer's fault, as they are in the same uncertainty as to the value of the rights. The unfairness here is to consider that only the contract should determine the remuneration of the author. Um, and this is something that is very much emphasized by, by the contractual freedom doctrine, I would say. Um, we believe, on the contrary, uh, that due to the specific situation of audiovisual authors who are forced to transfer their rights uh, at a time when nobody knows the value of them, the law should provide for specific protection and rights to remuneration for the use of the work, paid by the users and collectively managed by audiovisual authors' uh, representative uh, organizations. This is the only way to let the authors participate in the market and to accompany uh, the market success um, of the works. Um, yeah, this is a, a quote from uh, Cédric Clapiche, a French uh, screenwriter and director, who uh, uh, put the emphasis on, on the transfer of rights. Um, and I think it's interesting to look at the commercialization chain um, and all the intermediaries that you have between an author and the audience. It shows you that even when authors are able to negotiate contracts with proportionate remuneration per type of use, 
the number of intermediaries in the contractual chain uh, leaves little hope to see this money flowing back to them through the chain of contract. In practice, the only royalties that will, uh, with certainty, flow back to the authors from the use of their works are the ones that are collectively managed. Um, this is the case, for example, uh, for cable retransmission royalties, um, thanks to a, a directive from 1993, uh, which provides for mandatory collective management of the retransmission rights. And because in some laws, uh, like in Germany, there is an unwaivable right to remuneration for authors uh, that cannot be transferred to producers. This is also uh, the route that takes uh, some um, compensation for exceptions, such as private copying exception. But you, know, you can see that there are lots more exploitation that are taking place for audiovisual authors, in particular today with the internationalization of the exploitation and many um, uh, video on demand platforms that today do not uh, participate to the remuneration um, of the authors. Uh, talking about the cable retransmission right is a perfect transition to um, present you the broadcasting and the retransmission regulation, um, which is part of the European copyright reform um, package that was proposed by the Commission in September 2016. Um, so this uh, regulation aims to apply uh, the uh, directive principle to new usages, um, but the Commission did not propose to, to revise the directive, uh, which, was a, which, which would have been logical, um, but they proposed a regulation, um, and the regulation is directly applicable uh, in the member states, um, so with no implementation law in between. Um, like the 1993 directive, the Commission proposal has two parts, one on the country of origin principle uh, that the Commission wants to apply to broadcasters and ancillary online services, and this is all about the territoriality uh, debate that I'm sure you've heard about. Um, and then the second part uh, extends the mandatory collective management model of the cable retransmission right to other retransmission services, whether through uh, IPTV or, or satellite uh, uh, services. Um, both the European Parliament and the Council have adopted their position and now uh, they will enter into institu interinstitutional negotiation with the Commission uh, next week. Uh, it will be the first sorry, with the Council and the Commission. Um, yeah, Council, Parliament and Commission are the three institutions that will negotiate the final text. Um, and uh, so we expect a final text in June, July. Nobody knows exactly how long it will take to, to agree. Um, as part of the same package, uh, we have the Directive on Copyright in the Digital Single Market, which pursue the harmonization process on copyright that started in, in the 90s. Uh, so this uh, directive aims at harmonizing further the European copyright in a number of fields in relation to the digital era. So we have a uh, um, provision about exceptions out of commerce works, press publishers protection, platforms, uh, liability for, for the work uploaded by users. Um, we have also important provision um, for, um, to impose a transparency obligation on producers and publishers to whom, to whom authors and performers transfer their rights um, so that they can be informed of the ex exploitation of their work. And a bestseller clause um, if they want to claim additional remuneration for the unpredictable unpredictable success of their work. However, with this text, as it was proposed by the Commission, audiovisual authors are left behind. Um, Article 13 on platforms liability is mainly for music authors, uh, whose work are widely used on users uploaded platforms, such as YouTube. And Article 14 to 16 are general provision on transparency with no remuneration mechanism as such, uh, except the bestseller clause. So bestseller clause, you have to go to court uh, and, and, and take action, while we would, uh, want, we would like to have a more um, a mechanism that would remunerate all authors for the exploitation of their works. 
Um, I'm not going to, to spend too much time on, on the regulation because I think here it's interesting to focus on the, on the directive because we have the, the rapporteur for uh, the European Parliament uh, on stage. Uh, so let me skip one of the um, slides and go directly on what's missing for audiovisual um, authors in the directive. Well, I think I've already been clear. Uh, we need an unwaivable right to remuneration for the on-demand exploitation of audiovisual authors' works because on-demand exploitation is becoming one of the main ways the audience access uh, your films and, and audiovisual uh, works. Um, audiovisual authors normally already enjoy uh, the making available right uh, since the 2001 directive but they experience the same difficulties to implement it in their contracts are as any other rights. So um, whether in principle or in theory they have a right, an exclusive right, in practice uh, they can't trade any uh, good remuneration for it. That's why the representative organization of audiovisual authors in Europe, FERA for film directors, FSE for uh, screenwriters, and SA for the collective management organization in this sector, um, have proposed an um, EU harmonized model of remuneration um, for the on-demand exploitation. So conc in, in concrete terms, it means that when authors transfer their rights to producers in their contract, we do not challenge this transfer of rights because it's necessary for the producer to exploit the work. But when they transfer their exclusive right to the producer, they would retain a right to remuneration that would be paid directly by the users, the on-demand platform, and collectively managed, so that to avoid the long contractual chain uh, with the many intermediaries. This model already exists uh, for the retransmission right, as we uh, know in Germany, um, but it, it is also in place in a few uh, other countries, uh, such as Spain, Italy, France, Belgium, in different ways, but it applies for on-demand exploitation. So this is something that is, uh, uh, has proven that it works and that you can put in place this, uh, this kind of mechanism. What we need is a European uh, system, so we need it to be included in the directive so that if you are an audiovisual author, wherever you work and wherever your uh, work is exploited, you can be associated to the success um, of, um, of your work uh, on, on demand exploitation. It has been already adopted by two committees of the European Parliament in their opinion on the directive last July, the Culture Committee, and Mrs. Truppel was uh, very much involved in, um, in the adoption of this uh, provision, and the Industry Committee, which is normally seen as more um, not a necessarily a favorable committee to creators, but they have seen that it's not a problem. It's not uh, something that is going to disrupt the industry. So uh, we were quite lucky to convince them that this is something reasonable um, to have in, in the directive. And now it's in the hands of the Legal Affairs Committee of the European Parliament to make the, the final decision for, on this text. And in parallel, the, the Council, the Member States, also have to make uh, their decision on the directive in, in the coming, coming weeks uh, or months. Um, so to help uh, policymakers to understand the situation of audiovisual authors and, and their need for an unwaverable right to remuneration, uh, we have published several documents, uh, such as an infographic, I have a few copies uh, of them, and in, including in German, a video and a misbusting uh, a document to address most of the arguments that we've heard against the right to remuneration because I think we, we need to, uh, to hear people who uh, do not seem very favorable to it and, and we have tried to, to reassure that uh, this is something uh, uh, reasonable and uh, to explain how it already works in, in, in the countries where it is the case. So we can only encourage you to sign and share the petition we launched uh, at the end of uh, January in support of uh, uh, this uh, new provision in the directive. We already uh, received um, 7,000 signatures, but we need more, uh, of course, uh, to uh, show that there is a, a, a strong demand behind this. Uh, performers, organizations who also uh, uh, want the same right to apply, and, and we are together on this battle, 
they already done a, a petition who reached uh, 30,000 signatures. So I think it's a, it's a good target um, for us. Um, tomorrow, to finish, uh, there will be the European Film Forum in the, um, organized by the European Commission uh, in the Ritz-Carlton. And there will be a few uh, filmmakers uh, who will uh, talk, uh, Christian Munju and uh, Radu Mieleanu, um, who uh, have a sort of conversation. And I'm, I'm sure they will mention this, uh, uh, the need for such a, such a provision. So thank you very much for your attention. And uh, I wish you a, a very good discussion on this uh, important topic. <laughs>